Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Will Pomerantz, and I am the Deputy Director of the Cannon Institute, and we are happy to welcome uh, you for today's event, reflecting on state building in Ukraine's uh, 30 years of independence, uh, although I can anticipate that other topics will intervene as well. Before uh, we begin, I encourage you to stay up to date with on the latest Kennan Institute events and publications by visiting our website and subscribing to our two blogs, Focus Ukraine and The Russia File, as well as our podcast, Kennan X and The Russia File. Uh, if you have any questions for our speakers, you can send them by email to kennan at wilsoncenter.org, to our Twitter at Kennan Institute, or write on our Facebook page, please be sure to include your name and affiliation when submitting a question. Uh, we're, we have a star-studded panel, so I'm going to begin. And our first speaker is Alexander Moreshko. Uh, Ms. Moreshko is a member of the Vehavda Rada and chair of the Committee on Foreign Policy and Inter Interparliamentary Cooperation for, uh, for Ukraine. Uh, he is an expert in international trade law and uh, trade law and law and practice of the European Union and public and private international law. He has received numerous fellowships and awards, uh, but I want to emphasize that he is also a former Fulbright Kennan Institute research scholar at the Kennan Institute. So without further ado, Alexander, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. First of all, it's a great pleasure and honor to participate in this event. And I really miss Kennan Institute and Woodrow Wilson Center. Uh, the topic for our uh, for my presentation and for our discussion turned out to be really difficult. It, it gave me uh, I had uh, to give lots of thought to to this topic, and it took me several weeks to think about it. What are achievements and what are failures of uh, Ukrainian state for the last thirty years, which have been very dramatic and very crucial? And I think that perhaps uh, the biggest achievement is the fact that the Ukrainian state has formed and that it exists, that it has sur survived despite external Russian aggression and despite internal economic and political problems. Uh, now it's a state in a state of war, which makes uh, our life difficult, but nevertheless, we can see uh, progress, maybe progress, we can see certain evolution. But in order to assess the progress which has been made, we need to take into, into consideration two points. First of all, point of departure for the development of the Ukrainian state, and second, point of destination. As for point of departure, uh, we know from history that it, it has all started uh, as uh, uh, our state was built uh, on the basis uh, of, so to speak, totalitarian Soviet state, which had centralized economy. Uh, and at the same time, it, uh, I always pay attention to the psychological aspects. And in terms of psychology, uh, the dominant psychological type was so, so uh, called homo Sovieticus, which means uh, passive, easily manipulated by propaganda, authoritarian personality. We have started with this very difficult, terrible uh, legacy and baggage. Uh, as for our point of destination, uh, here we have different points of view because it, according to our constitution, uh, we are talking about uh, Euro integration, becoming a full-fledged member of uh, NATO and the European Union. But uh, in my opinion, the point of destination against which we can assess our progress and our evolution should be liberal democracy. A liberal democracy based on such values as, first of all, human rights, uh, decentralized economic model, rule of law, which means non-corrupt, uh, truly independent from, uh, from political uh, power judicial system. So these are basic things and our basic uh, uh, goal. Basically, what we need, uh, in my opinion, it's also related to the point of destination is a new uh, constitution like in the United States based on two basic things. First of all, inalienable constitutional rights and second, uh, political systems grounded in checks and balances system. We also uh, need a change in mass and uh, individual psychology, so to speak from authoritarian personality to democratic personality. 
personality, by democratic personality, I mean a person with critical thinking, independent person uh, who relies on his own efforts, uh, including sphere of economy, tolerant person, uh, a person who respects the rights of other people and who is ready to defend his own rights. Uh, and I always believe that we need such a psychological uh, um, psychological change because uh, it forms the underpinning of our society and eventually uh, the basis of our state. What we have now, uh, now mm, I would describe the model which we have uh, as a oligarchic post-Soviet state. Uh, we can see in this uh, state uh, a mixture of different elements. Uh, we can see elements of what Immanuel Wallerstein called peripheral capitalism, or what is known as crony capitalism in political literature. We also can observe elements of oligarchic model of economy and political life, because uh, uh, before uh, President Zelensky came to power and started his uh, campaign, his program against uh, aimed at dismantling oligarchic capitalism in Ukraine, we had uh, five, so to speak, biggest families, which controlled uh, basically economic and eventually political uh, life. Uh, one of the biggest problems which we have now uh, in terms of state building is a inherited problem of mutual distrust between the state and the people. Uh, it goes uh, uh, back to the Soviet times totalitarian past because in Soviet times, the state was viewed by people living in the territory as a, a oppressor, as a, a instrument of repression uh, in the hands of a totalitarian elite. Um, nowadays, uh, the state was used uh, during the last uh, 30 years, was used also uh, by our oligarchs uh, to enrich themselves. To, to steal from the budget. So this model of capitalism differs from liberal capitalism in the West, because if in the liberal capitalism we have uh, um, competition as a basic driving force of the economic development, in oligarchic model of capitalism, uh, we have a group of oligarchs who are trying to use monopoly to enrich themselves and who are trying to use budget, uh, basically to steal from it. Uh, so, uh, uh, we need to change uh, uh, regarding this mutual distrust. The population still, uh, by inertia, maybe distrust continues to distrust the state and its institution. Uh, that's why we need to develop this uh, mutual trust between state institutions to um, sort of get rid of uh, oligarchic influence and at the same time uh, to. Um, develop the trust on the part of people to state institutions, to uh, make them uh, responsible citizens and to develop, of course, civic society. Uh, as for uh, democracy, kind of democracy which we have now, uh, I mean the influence of oligarchic circles, it is based uh, pretty much on the balance of power between oligarchs who uh, decides uh, as an uh, example, when Poroshenko was elected as a president, but before that, he had to obtain sort of permission or consensus on the part of oligarchs. So uh, we need to change this model, uh, of course. And um, what happened in the year 2019, uh, when President uh, Zelensky was elected as a president, uh, we had um, you know, the so-called electoral Maidan, or to me, it was something different. It was uh, first of all, a uh, revolution of young people, because we have in power now a new generation of politicians uh, who are more liberal, more pro-European, who uh, uh, don't have this legacy of Homo Sovieticus. And uh, I think that um, the best example for the development of our state uh, to follow is American model, which I have described uh, in the beginning, and also maybe Polish model, because Poland as a state and society, they had similar programs, uh, problems uh, maybe like 20 years ago. And uh, I believe that um, uh, one of the achievements, as I said, is a gradual, gradual evolution in the direction of liberal uh, democracy. But the thing is that it might take 
uh, maybe several generations to achieve this goal. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Alexander. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Katerina Pishikova. Uh, she is an associate professor of political science and international relations at the eCampus University. She was a visiting scholar at Cornell University, as well as the Transatlantic Academy and at the Kennan Institute. So Katerina, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you for having me. It's a, it's a pleasure and an honor to be part of this uh, panel to reflect back on the 30 years of Ukraine's um, independent, independence and its state building efforts. I'm uh, going to be the political scientist on the uh, on the panel, so I will try to um, summarize in in just about ten minutes <laughs> the uh, uh, the kind of summary assessment of of the Ukrainian uh, politics. And I think, um, uh, really, by way of uh, of summarizing this, um, it's important to uh, to start by saying that the Ukrainian political sphere. Um, has always uh, remained fairly pluralistic and competitive compared to other uh, post-Soviet states. And of course, uh, I need to put immediately a footnote here and to say that uh, uh, this is the kind of pluralism and competitiveness um, that uh, was uh, present in the absence of a consolidated party system because political parties in Ukraine continue to be more individualistic, uh, in, you know, individual political projects and not so much uh, established uh, organizations. So the, the, the competitiveness is on a personalistic basis. It's not a, a structural feature. So this is, of course, an important um, uh, point which connects to the remarks that Alexander has just made. But there is a positive side to it nonetheless, I would argue, because this has prevented lasting centralization of power in Ukraine over the past 30 years. Um, if we think back to the most obvious example, when President Yanukovych was elected in 2010, he uh, then managed to um, uh, further consolidate his power in 2012 when his uh, party gained the majority in the parliament. But then only two years later, in 2014, we had Euromaidan, which was partially exactly uh, the kind of societal response against uh, uh, Yanukovych's attempts at uh, centralizing power in his hands and the hands of his uh, friends and the relatives. Um, uh, so the, 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 there's an important uh, value to this, um, uh, maybe somewhat, uh, somewhat um, underdeveloped uh, uh, or uh, let's say not really uh, um, properly democratic way of, uh, of managing political competition nonetheless. There's a negative side to it as well, of course, because it produces kind of more fragmented and fragile politics. And uh, again, the textbook example from Ukraine is the kind of bickering and political stalemate that we observed in the wake of the Orange Revolution um, and that really points to the difficulties in forming kind of lasting coalitions and, and producing far-reaching structural reform, which kind of partially explains the superficial and piecemeal approach to reform in Ukraine so far. Um, so really um, uh, taken together, this, this shows us that Ukraine remains a fairly fragile state and it really needs to boost uh, its resilience by completing the institutional reform, completing and strengthening its institutions. But at the same time, looking at the uh, state society relations, I would argue that the Ukrainian glass is really half full rather than half empty. And, and in this, I think um, uh, I'm going to emphasize the, uh, the more uh, hopeful perspective that ha has already been um, uh, uh, introduced by the previous speaker, um, because Ukrainian society has evolved a lot over the, over the past three decades, so with the generational change, as well as um, other uh, developments that kind of acted as catalysts and as a kind of a, a booster of of civic consciousness. Um, I've recently done a research project together with the uh, German Marshall Fund for the uh, German Marshall Fund of the United States on the uh, civic engagement in Eastern partnership countries. And these are for the American audience. These are um, six countries, uh, Belarus, Moldova, Ukraine, Armenia, um, Georgia, and Azerbaijan. And even among these six countries, Ukraine really stood out as, as the country with the growing civic engagement. Um, very interesting innovation in civil society, very good experience with cross-sector uh, partnership for reforms, 
um, uh, so th this th th there are there are lots of success stories in this sense, um, but these are they are very limited as well so far in the sense that these are kind of more happy islands, and they are very often mostly Kiev based. So these things, uh, these realities, and uh, these experiences have to expand. And it's especially important that they move towards uh, uh, big regional centers such as Kharkiv, Dnipro, Odessa, other places, so that uh, uh, these other um, cities and these other uh, communities mirror the kind of a positive civic dynamic that is taking place in the capital rather than serve as a pool of human resources for whatever uh, is happening in the capital. Um, but the Ukrainian civil society is not disengaged um, and there is indeed growing societal demand for transparency, for accountability, for reform. Um, I would probably put another uh, little footnote here as well, again, based on this recent research that the, um, there still seems to be quite a, um, a gap uh, in the society between its uh, uh, mobilization potential, meaning mobilization for mass protest, and the levels of civic engagement. And this is often overlooked because uh, uh, Ukrainian civil society has this, uh, uh, you know, has acquired this fame for being active. Um, but, you know, a, a readiness to protest in the face of uh, a major crisis, be that, you know, economic, political or, or of any other nature is, is one thing. And civic engagement, which is more a kind of a routinized practice of uh, cooperation and collective problem solving in this society, that is something else. And I think there are, again, there are good things happening on that in that level. And there's really a place where international actors working with civil society in Ukraine need to invest more. Um, uh, so that the, uh, uh, the, this, uh, this becomes a more kind of widespread and more, as I said, more routinized in, and more accepted in this society. Uh, again, probably connecting to the, uh, to the argument that has uh, been just made by Alexander uh, about the uh, kind of civic culture and, um, and civic and political culture, um, because that would really boost the societal resilience over longer term, and that would really be um, uh, important for state society relations in the longer term. Now, um, obviously, this is where um, the, the, the good news ends, unfortunately, and uh, because if we look at the uh, state building efforts in Ukraine, we cannot really not, not talk about uh, the loss of sovereignty and the ongoing war in uh, Crimea and uh, in Donbass. Um, and if we really want to look for a silver lining to this uh, huge cloud over Ukraine, um, we could say that, um, you know, the, 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 since 2014 especially, there has been um, uh, a boost to, uh, to uh, uh, national identity and uh, recent fairly detailed sociological data really uh, shows that we're talking about um, a stronger sense of belonging to the Ukrainian state as opposed to more uh, peculiaristic, more narrow uh, understandings of identity as uh, along ethnic or linguistic lines. And, and so this is certainly a good sign and a good news. But this is pretty much um, all good there is to it, unfortunately, because of course the war is a major strain on the country, economically, socially, in terms of human life, in terms of human security. And the loss of sovereignty more generally, unfortunately means that Ukrainian leadership is, uh, does not really have uh, full authority in, in the country and is very much hostage to the ongoing war, uh, both in international and in domestic uh, uh, politics. And, to conclude, I would really like to, uh, to underline the international dimension of, of this conflict, because uh, it is clearly part of a, of a, of a bigger issue and a bigger rivalry uh, on the, in the international system between um, Russia and NATO uh, in, the, in, in terms of uh, European security, or even more generally between the liberal democratic West and you know, the not so liberal, not so democratic, definitely non-Western um, rest. So there's, there's a general tendency, there's a general problem, I think, in, in, in international relations in terms of uh, this uh, backsliding, if we, if we wish, uh, towards greater confrontation and much less cooperation. Um, and Ukraine is just a, a tiny part of it, a tiny sort of exemplary uh, story to it. But um, going back to the question of where Ukraine stands, um, the implication is that essentially there's very little Ukraine itself can do to address the root causes of the ongoing war with Russia. Um, and so tying this back to domestic politics, this, of course, puts Ukrainian leadership in a very difficult situation and creates the kind of fragility that I mentioned earlier. 
uh, because unless uh, uh, Ukraine is prepared to give up its sovereignty completely, for which there is no uh, popular support, no societal support in the country, um, if Ukraine can certainly keep on making a series of tactical moves. Uh, you know, there's, there's quite, quite a good margin by now that I would argue. We know there's some worrying news coming, uh, coming uh, from the front line, but uh, I would say there is margin for, uh, for, for uh, tactical moves to avoid escalation, to prevent the loss of life and so on. But there's not really um, so much margin for implementing a, a long-term strategy in terms of conflict resolution. And this is very taxing politically uh, for the Ukrainian leadership, because if you are an elected leader in a relatively democratic setting, you need to build a success story out of whatever you do. And it's very difficult to build it around um, these kinds of small compromise steps that you're taking uh, uh, basically to keep the status quo without really uh, being able to, um, to, to achieve a breakthrough in terms of conflict resolution. Um, because at the same time, if you build a more bold narrative uh, uh, about resolving the conflict, it backfires eventually, as we have seen, uh, because there is really not much uh, concrete policy that you manage to implement uh, 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 to, to support this narrative. So in that sense, I think Ukrainian leadership has been a hostage of the war uh, since, since it started. Um, but also more broadly, I would say that Ukrainian politics and Ukraine and Ukrainian society is, is very much um, hostage uh, to the war and, and a lot of things that and a lot of successes that we have uh, been talking about and we have registered um, are still very much, uh, uh, um, you know, it's difficult to consolidate them and to move forward because of this uh, uh, situation. And um, I would stop there. I'm sure we will uh, come back uh, to this issue in the discussion as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Katerina. Um, I don't think we have managed to get uh, Georgi Kasyanov, so we're going to move on to Misha Minikov. Uh, just a reminder, though, if you have a question for our speakers, you can send them uh, uh, via email to kennan at wilsoncenter.org, to our Twitter at Kennan Institute, or right on our Facebook page. So we will turn it over to uh, Mikhail Minikov, who is the Kennan Institute Senior Advisor on Ukraine and Editor-in-Chief of Focus Ukraine, uh, our, our Kennan's uh, Ukraine-focused blog. He is also the Editor-in-Chief of the Ideology and Politics Journal. So without further ado, Misha, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Will. And today I would like to return to the date. Why do we actually make this event today on the 1st of December? Basically 30 years ago, that day, Ukrainian population, the Soviet Ukrainians, made a decision to be independent. Even though the parliament has already proclaimed on, in August 24 the independence, it, the parliament needed uh, support by Ukrainians. And that was a critical period for the beginning of post-Soviet Ukrainian history. Today, I will need to show several slides and uh, which can, could be like, helpful to understand what was happening with the Ukrainians in that year, 30 years ago. As uh, Alexander mentioned, it was the period, uh, well, this S Soviet populations were learning how to participate in politics. The first act of participation was in 1989 when there were first elections to, to the all Soviet uh, parliament. In 1990, Ukrainians voted for uh, the Ukrainian parliament, for the first free ele freely elected Ukrainian parliament. And then in 1991, uh, these populations, citizens were learning how to participate in referenda. The first one was connected with this illegal uh, referendum in Crimea, which uh, the results were not recognized, neither by Kyiv nor by, uh, Moscow at that time. But then in March 1991, 70% of Ukrainians supported the reformed Soviet Union, 80% supported Ukraine's membership in uh, the USSR. But after the uh, attempted coup in August, and then the declaration uh, as a result of the existential threat for Ukraine to exist, 
then there was the decision for independence made. And uh, the, 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 the period of decommunization starts when the Communist Party is being uh, prohibited by the court, the KGB is being dismissed, the uh, party uh, property is being acquired either by government or by local governments. This process slowly prepares citizens, make them feel more um, engaged in creation of their own new republic. And on December 1, 1991, uh, we have 90% of Ukrainian population supporting the uh, idea. The question was formulated, do you support the declaration of independence? And 90% of Ukrainians said yes. With the majority of Ukrainians in Crimea, the majority in Donbas were also uh, supporting this idea. And then, uh, I would like to look at the, these achievements or failures through the point of view of democratization. So in a way, all the post-Soviet countries were created uh, as a part of this uh, third wave of democratization, the global wave. And here, Ukrainian citizens were learning how to control their rulers, the power elites. And this is how the, uh, the construction uh, was going on through democratization, through state building at the same time, but also economy building, legal system building. It was highly uh, difficult, highly creative period uh, of Ukrainian history. And on this graph, you can see this, like all three elements of democratization, the uh, creation of electoral democracy, creation of a legal system that supports and forces all the actors to play by democratic rules. So liberal democracy index and participatory democracy index, they show how it grows from this zero point in 1990 to a pretty much high level. So you can see, for example, from this graph that Ukrainian electoral democracy was really far ahead while participation and uh, legal system supporting democracy were lagging behind. There's always like a difference. Our elections are not guided only by the legal uh, uh, infrastructure. At the same time, you can see that basically up until creation of uh, constitution when elites found uh, a compromise and established uh, the, the constitution in 1996. Ukraine was slow uh, reformer by that time. And after that, there's a slow period of autocrat autocratization actually. So if we look at democratization waves, autocratization waves, we see that uh, then for 30 years, Ukraine was oscillating between more freedom and less freedom from democratic point of view. Uh, it also shows uh, if you count these waves, you can actually see that uh, out of 30 years that we had in this period between the decisive referendum 30 years ago and today, uh, there were 12 years of democratization, there were 10 years of autocratization, and there were periods of in-between. Uh, so they both actually show this uh, uh, drawbacks and achievements. But if we compare Ukraine with our neighboring countries like Belarus and Russia, we can actually see how the post-Soviet roots are deviating. So in the beginning, this first four years after the fall of Soviet Union, you definitely see this brave, uh, activity in state building, democracy building, and economic, economy building. But then approximately uh, in the beginning of uh, 21st century, by end of uh, 1990s, the path is starting, uh, dec like the, the path of autocratization becomes more and more visible. The champion, of course, at that time was Belarus and, Bel and Lukashenko regime. But Russia was slowly following it after the elections of Vladimir Putin. While Ukraine uh, made a decisive distortion in, this, in, in the path as post-Soviet uh, routes that um, Ukraine, Russia, and Belarus ch have chosen, 
the, the orange revolution and the new wave of democratization. And at that moment, the, the deviation and these different uh, uh, paths were actually in place. And even uh, if we look at the period of 2014, when the democratic opportunity uh, provided by the Euromaidan was not uh, used because of the war and many other oligarchic resistance, uh, later in 2019, that's the period of new uh, liberalization in Ukraine. And it's connected to what uh, Alexander was mentioning already to this uh, electoral revolution in Ukraine. So uh, I would uh, finish my uh, today's uh, intervention with this graph here. Sorry, it's still in, in Ukrainian, but you can see this pink line. It's uh, the opinion of, of Ukrainians about where Ukraine is actually moving, where, where does it develop? And the green line shows dissatisfaction uh, satisfaction with the direction of development and the pink line uh, shows dissatisfaction. You can see that uh, there was a period of high hopes in 2019 and 20 and slowly the uh, frustration of population was coming into the picture. And today we have around 69% of population being dissatisfied with the uh, direction of development. And probably that's this biggest part of population that would say that, that would pessimistically assess this path of 30 years. But we still have approximately a quarter of population that is optimistic about where Ukraine uh, is moving. So I would conclude here that I know that in the United States, it's also approximately 60% this year, last month, was dissatisfied with the direction of development. But uh, unlike in authoritarian regimes or in autocratic uh, countries, this dissatisfaction does not lead to necessarily lead to the mass protest and disruption of governance. This kind of uh, dissatisfaction is also a call of citizens for the power elites, for the ruling groups to actually respond, to uh, start working better, faster, and reform smartly. So I will finish with this and I think we can respond to the questions. Thank you very much, Misha. Again, if you have questions for our speakers, you can send them by email to Kennan at wilsoncenter.org, to our Twitter account at Kennan Institute, or right on our Facebook page. And I wanna begin with uh, the anniversary events. And I want to begin with a question. Um, we talk about the rise of nationalism um, and this incredible vote in December, 1991 for independence. My initial question is, to what extent did the Soviet Union underestimate this whole nationality question? Um, I, I remember that, you know, e even after the results were known, um, it was really kind of surprising that such an overwhelming part of the population voted for independence. So my initial question is, why was the Soviet Union and Gorbachev and others so unprepared for Ukrainian independence? And why did they think that um, it, it, that the union itself was secure? Uh, okay, or I'll try to answer this difficult question. To me, it's more a matter of ideology. We remember that by 1991, the Soviet ideology, which held together the whole Soviet society, uh, there are basically were two factors which held society, Soviet society together. Repressions on the one hand, on the other hand, ideology. But by 1991, the Soviet ideology had been discredited. It was in shambles. And the last straw was uh, the abortive coup d'etat in, in Moscow at that time. And of course, there was a vacuum left by Soviet ideology. And uh, to me, national identity became an alternative to that. And uh, we started the process of national building and development of national identities in uh, post-Soviet at that time countries. So uh, this feeling of national identity played a key 
uh, psychological role at, at that time. And of course, uh, the Soviet leadership at that time uh, did underestimate the influence and importance of uh, uh, national identity because they thought that uh, artificial concept of Soviet uh, citizen or Soviet human being uh, was uh, deeply entrenched in, in mass sex, psyche, but they proved to be wrong. Uh, turned out to be that still national identity played uh, 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 maybe in a sort of underground, but still was, was important. And when the right time came, uh, uh, the peoples, the nations uh, of former Soviet republics, uh, they uh, started their own uh, way uh, of development uh, on the basis of uh, their own national identity. If I may, Will, uh, since uh, Georgi Kasyanov couldn't make yes. it for our today's event, I will use his argument in his wonderful book dedicated <clears throat> to the history of 15 years of first Ukrainian years of independence. He was actually showing how, uh, how the, the entire constellation of power groups in Ukraine was uh, a difficult one. So in a way, in, in the beginning of 1990, there was still the majority of Ukrainian communists supporting the Soviet Union. But the more uh, liberals were taking over in Moscow, the national uh, communists didn't want to follow the, the, the line and wanted to have a distance. So in 1991, when uh, Ivashko, the, the, this pro-Gorbachev Ukrainian leader, left for Moscow, uh, suddenly Leonid Kravchuk, who didn't stand a chance, finally got a chance to actually move ahead and bring the union between national democrats and national communists for, this, for the case of independence. I remember that in his interview and in conversation with uh, Kravchuk, uh, I, he was confessing actually that it was a decisive moment in uh, the days of August of the putsch in Moscow and when Ukrainian uh, elites were looking how to resolve the situation and how to move on. Uh, this combination, this consensus of elites on independence was very important. But here we had many different factors. First of all, this uh, feeling of nationhood, which was very important, but also this pragmatism of national communists who didn't want to deal with the Yeltsin, Yeltsinitz uh, liberals. And uh, in addition, uh, there's also a slow learning process of Ukrainian populations, because in order to have 90% votes, it, it, it really takes time of uh, communication. So in a way, this 1991 for me uh, is a year when we, we reinvented Aristot Aristotelian um, definition of politics. It's koinonia, the, the communication between the citizens about the highest of the goods. And the independence was seen as this highest of the good. Thank you, Misha. Uh, Katarina, do you wanna add? Well, um, very briefly, really, uh, so I'm kind of to follow up on the argument about the, uh, the civil society as well. Um, I think some of the surprise in, in, in this outcome comes from, uh, from the lack of uh, uh, um, habits to actually listen to the public opinion, which wasn't really a, a staple feature of, of Soviet politics, right? And there wasn't really much of a feedback loop between the state and the society. Um, and Ukraine, uh, uh, as much as, for example, also Armenia or, uh, uh, or other places in, in other Soviet, uh, Soviet republics, it did have uh, important uh, national uh, civic initiatives and civic movements before 1991. And one is, of course, had to do with uh, Chernobyl disaster and that people mobilized to kind of uh, respond to the, to the Chernobyl disaster and so the kind of the uh, nascent environmental movement. The other one has to, had to do with the uh, soldiers' mothers. There was a similar movement in Russia as well. So uh, there were, I think there was a good sort of ground on which the, the, the kind of dynamic that Mikhail has just described and very eloqu eloquently 
I think there was a good preparatory work done for that as well. There were already structures in this society that the kind of civic engagement that I mentioned when I was talking about contemporary Ukraine, you know, history teaches us that it does matter when, when you know, when, when things start moving, it doesn't matter what kind of fabric you have in this society, what kind of uh, civic structures you have in this society already in place before things start changing quickly and before sort of the, the, the major rupture comes, uh, comes into, into the picture. Th th thank you, Katerina. Um, another question that comes up from a lot of, of mo moving to more recent developments is this new generational move, as it were, a, a new generation rising after 30 years of Ukrainian independence. And so if you could just touch on this theme um, as in terms of you know, more liberal, more Western, uh, more opportunities to go abroad, et cetera, uh, Katerina talked about how that is changing Ukraine, but if everyone could kind of mention and talk about this new generation and what are the positive attributes of this new generation and the more negative attributes. Uh, who, who wants to lead with that? So Alexander, would you like to start? Uh, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Oh no. Yes. Ah, uh, great. So, uh, actually, it's it's a great question because uh, now we have a completely new generation with different personnel, uh, free thinking, the more critical part of a broad European. Uh, they. Uh, well, have access to music, to movies, to Western culture. For example, my generation didn't have it in our uh, in our time. So we have completely new generation. And uh, I, I can share you with you uh, one episode when I had been teaching uh, in Poland at one of the Polish universities. There was a group of Ukrainian students, and uh, some of them had asked, "Was life in the Soviet Union in the Soviet Union like?" You know, and I was I was amazed by this question because I realized at that moment that I'm uh, talking to people who have no this uh, uh, experience of life in totalitarian society. They they uh, have no idea, and it's it's good because they uh, they live they were brought up in absolutely different, much more free atmosphere, and I think it's great. Uh, to me, uh, our people young people who go to study, for example, abroad, uh, they uh, very easily mix together with uh, local students, Western students, and you cannot see the difference between them in terms of uh, mentality, in terms of the way, uh, how they dress, what kind of culture and music they prefer and so on. So they became, uh, I would say cosmopolitan in a way. Yes, so, and they very easily adapt themselves to uh, Western culture. So to me, they're very different. Uh, as for uh, negative sides, uh, it's hard to, to think of any kind of, uh, maybe, maybe mm, they want uh, everything and at once, maybe, maybe this one. Yeah, but I'm not sure about that. But in general, uh, the more I look at our generation, new generation, the more optimistic I become about future of Ukraine. Um, if I may add uh, maybe a comparative element, as I mentioned, this uh, recent research on the six different post-Soviet countries that are, you know, in, 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 in Europe, they're grouped into the system partnership framework, <clears throat> but they actually are six very different countries because, you know, the Belar Belarus is, uh, has had a completely different political trajectory compared to Russia. Mikhail has just illustrated that. Um, the three uh, republics in the Caucasus had also had very different experience. Um, and when we started this research, we obviously had this question about the generational change and, you know, the famous Homo Sovieticus, the question was, is it still there, you know, can we still find Homo Sovieticus in the, uh, in the former republics? Uh, but the, comp the lesson, the comparative lesson is that, uh, that obviously there is no longer a, a Homo Sovieticus, just as Alexander have said, I mean, there are certain people who remember 
uh, the way life was, but there's you know fewer and fewer in numbers, and and they are less involved, le less actively involved in, in in politics and in public life. Uh, but what struck us uh, comparing these different countries is that Yan and Yun doesn't necessarily mean more democratic. So it really matters what kind of experience, what kind of post-Soviet experience these people have um, have had, and what kind of cult political culture they grew up with. Mm -hmm. And so when we looked at Azerbaijan, for example, you know, the picture was pretty dramatic because, because of the war as well, right? So the, there was a whole generation, this new, new and young, were not necessarily people who were more open-minded. There were people who were really shaped by this very strong uh, ongoing conflict with, uh, with Armenia, so very strong, uh, more conflictual identity, you know, uh, uh, more starkly defined uh, in, in opposition to the, to the other. Um, uh, uh, other places, you know, young generation did not have as much opportunities to uh, to be exposed to different places and to travel and and you know to get um, education. So um, so I think this is kind of a cautionary tale that we should sort of uh, you know again a little footnote to put here that um, th these are not post they are, these are not post Soviet generations anymore. And, you know they they have nothing to do with the Soviet anymore. But this doesn't mean that they're all uh, you know have had a similar experience and it doesn't mean that they all uh, you know see uh, as many opportunities at home that they all kind of have uh, share liberal values that they all uh, care more for democratic politics than they do for economic stability for example that they're less paternalistic than their uh, parents so I think this is uh, this is something that has to be taken with a grain of salt and and you know we have to be careful in assessing these dynamics and and yes I would uh, re reiterate that I think Ukraine is a uh, so far has been a very positive story precisely also for the fact that there are not so many young Ukrainians who are uh, actually looking to leave the country and, and, and build their lives elsewhere. And there was clearly a risk of that at a certain point that, you know, there would be a massive brain drain and, and you know, and Ukraine would not have this uh, kind of human capital uh, uh, in 2020. And, and, and this didn't happen. I think this is very good news as well. And I think it's worth mentioning the new generations of uh, power elites as well. And in my memory, there were at least three big waves of these new generations. Would you look into the press in the West and in Ukraine, let's say in 2000, uh, in 1994, when uh, Leonid Kuchma came with a group of reformers, they were called a oh, new generation that doesn't have any anything to do with the Soviet Union and starts creating new and independent and prosperous Ukraine. That's 1994. And that was actually a, a group of people who, who were, they did create this, the statehood, but also they, they created a strong Ukrainian hryvnia, they created economic, financial system, and they created oligarchy. That's also this generation that was thinking in this, uh, in this way. Then uh, same, if you look at newspapers in March 2005 in Ukraine and in the West, it's a new generation coming into power. And again, the argument is that it's not Soviet, it's very uh, nation nationally minded and it will bring democracy and prosperity. And then uh, in 2019, and every time you, you see indeed a new generation of rulers, of politicians, of officials are coming into the picture. And every time it takes time to learn how to rule, how to make politics, and how to take care about the common good. Thank you. Uh, we're gonna now go to our audience's question. Uh, we have a question from Tyson Boy. Uh, in your opinion, was the, was the long-term Ukrainian democratization helped or hindered by a slower process of economic liberalization as opposed to the economic shock therapy path taken by other countries such as Poland? And anyone want to comment on the, the, the relatively go slow approach as opposed to shock therapy? Yeah. I can give it a try, even though I'm not an economist. I'm a, a specialist uh, on law. Law uh, has to do it's it's a basically model of uh, based on the economy, economic life. Well, uh, I remember the saying: some country there were 
uh, uh, there, there is uh, shock uh, shock therapy. And I remember someone, um, maybe a Western economist, uh, has, has said that in Russia there was shock without therapy in terms of economics. So I prefer uh, gradual economic development and gradual economic evolu uh, evolution, sort of by error and trial, because it proved to be more effective. And nowadays, uh, well, if you take reforms of President Zelensky, you can, uh, there were very reforms. For example, the biggest one is that we, uh, President Zelensky and his team, uh, his uh, faction in the parliament, have opened the land market. I think it's extremely important for the uh, further economic development of Ukraine. And I also believe in uh, gradual economic evolution because it's more stable. It, it happens, it occurs without ruptures, and it, it, it becomes more deeply entrenched in social life, political life also. Well, I would like to add here, there's a, this famous graph that Anders Aslund uh, in one of his books showed the, the comparison of the loss in GDP or growth in GDP of Poland, Russia, and Ukraine in the first 10 years of independence. So between 1991 and uh, 2001, Poland a little bit grew. So there was a decline, but then there, there was a growth connected to the shock reforms in, uh, and also by uh, participation of direct foreign investors who were eager to come into the reformed economy. And then there's Russia with a considerable loss in these 10 first years, but still much less than in Ukraine. Uh, in Russia, the, uh, it was a fast reformer in political terms, but slow reformer in economic terms, and it created these preconditions for specific oligarchy. In our case, we lost the most in terms of GDP, and uh, our households uh, lost their income for a very long time. This is why in, 2000, in 2004, in HDR report, Human Development Index report by UNDP showed that we even started inheriting the poverty. So poverty was a new phenomenon. And in our book that we published earlier this year on dedicated to these 30 years of Ukraine's development, poverty was one of the failures that uh, we, we got. There's also richness, and it's not clear if this kind of oligarchic richness is actually the achievement as well. But still, we, as the new uh, nation, new economy, we were learning how to live in it. And these first 10 years, slow reforms were, were punishing populations and creating this effect that later um, made a very strong impact on our demographic uh, demographic development. So demography is decreasing and there's a considerable loss of population also due to migration. So here we have this balance between gradual and sustainable and stable development and slowness. So the, the, the good medium should be found how to develop in these terms. Um. Yeah, I just wanted to come in very quickly because uh, this is such a, a common comparison, you know, in the early 90s, Poland and Ukraine, Ukraine had a, uh, uh, was actually uh, had better macroeconomic uh, indicators. And then, of course, we all know what happened, um, because what, what is often overlooked when we make this comparison uh, 30 years later is that uh, is the Europeanization process that Poland had access to and, and eventually became a member of the European Union and Ukraine did not. So, um, so I think just, I just wanted to add this element because I think the international context matters and the kind of international uh, cooperation that the country can um, uh, take advantage of matters a lot. Um, and this is also why I think the current situation in Ukraine is so um, dramatic if we, if we wish, because it's it just, even if, uh, if there is no uh, any major um, uh, escalation or any major, you know, uh, uh, new problem, just by not having a clear uh, uh, path towards a sort of a more strategic uh, development and a kind of 
stable cooperation in the long term because that's constantly uh, jeopardized by uh, by the broader uh, international uh, uh, conflict um, that is uh, that is hindering for the economy as well and that is, uh, really undermines uh, sustainable development in the long term our next question is from uh, Marina Cunningham and I'll summarize the question. She talks about how she was engaged uh, with educational reform in universities in the uh, immediately after the collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh, to And they had a State Department grant to introduce critical thinking into the curriculum. Um, and then she mentions that the funding stopped and all the key faculty members who had participated in the program were snatched up by other universities. So he, she asked, can you comment if the reform in education actually worked or and be, became permanent? Alexander was professor at the university. Would you like to say? Uh, yes, yes. In, in my previous life, I was a professor and to tell you the truth, I still remain uh, uh, deep, uh, deep down in my heart, a scholar, a legal scholar. Yes, uh, this is a re really painful issue. First of all, regarding critical thinking, I believe that uh, it's extremely important to develop, especially in children, in young people, in students, critical thinking. Because uh, philosophically, I belong to the current, which is uh, referred to as a critical rationalism. So I, I think critical thinking is absolutely necessary and it serves as antidote to a dogmatic thinking, which was developed and cultivated under the Soviet Union and uh, formed a part of the psyche of uh, Homo Sovieticus. So it's extremely important. As for changes in education, I more believe in uh, a creation of uh, Western type universities as islands of freedom and true uh, uh, academy. Uh, I believe that for Ukraine, as of now, it is better to uh, establish a couple of uh, Western type universities with uh, Western, for example, American professors, and uh, uh, which would set an example for the, the rest of Ukrainian universities. Because uh, um, I am a freedom in uh, 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 academic autonomy for the university. And unfortunately, our universities sometimes remind me feudal uh, principalities or feudal structures. And uh, we, we cannot always observe sort of democracy like in the American universities. To me, a uh, uh, best uh, ideal example in this respect is American campus, American university. And we can uh, do it only by uh, creation, cre creating, for example, branches of American universities in Ukraine and setting an uh, example for the rest of the universities. As former professor of Ukrainian university, I would also like to, to take this note from Alexander and uh, say, indeed, even in the most recent liberal reforms in education, when universities were receiving a lot of independence and autonomy, also financial autonomy, which is important, it still didn't work to create the academic republics. It was more this feudal fiefdoms uh, type of uh, organizations. You can also, you can easily see it when you go to the websites of universities, even the most improved, you can see the face uh, of Rector, the, the, the feudal, uh, uh, although not in all of them, but there are at least two universities that don't do it. And, uh, I'm glad that it's, we still have these two universities. But again, uh, if we look at these 30 years, we definitely see the increase in number of universities, of higher education um, institutions. However, uh, the, the quality of education had better times and worse times and it's not stable even today. So many good students having these wonderful opportunities to study in the West or in Central Europe, they make uh, these difficult choices to leave. And again, uh, I don't look at it as a brain drain. 
I'm right, I'm looking at it more uh, rather like investment into human capital that with time can return. And of course, the issue of academic freedom, recent um, uh, research showed that it's dropping right now, partially because of the securitization and, and the mi military situation. And um, th that's something that should be respected and capped at the highest level possible. Um, yeah, I just uh, really, I think this helps us connect several previous points about the, the new generation, you know, and that it's, we shouldn't take for granted how that new generation emerges and the kinds of values uh, it um, uh, makes its own. Um, but also, again, coming back to the issue of international cooperation and, and sort of moving towards policy prescriptions, if we like. Um, I think education is a great example because this is considered so much like this low politics uh, area of cooperation. This is sort of a, a low profile, technical, almost technical issue. So it's, it really is one of those uh, spheres for international cooperation that are really easy to deal with regardless of the of the general political context it's uh, and it's a it's a it's an amazing investment because you are as we've argued basically for the last hour you are investing into uh into the future resilience of of the society and of the state because this is the future elite as well so um so i think uh, absolutely i mean there's uh, there's need to be more of this uh, kind of cooperation and it has to be designed in a way that um that the, uh, the results are uh, transferable and replicable uh, within the country so that it's not kind of spot on initiatives when, and when uh, some faculty leaves, the whole thing falls apart. And so there's not much return on the investment. And that's, you know, that's the technicality of it, of course. But um, uh, I think it, it, it's one of those issues that are never considered to be a priority uh, issue, but uh, they almost have to become uh, uh, sort of, they almost have to move higher up on the priority list, I think. Thank you, Katharina. Uh, a reminder to our audience that if you have questions for our speakers, you can send them by email to Kennan at wilsoncenter.org, to our Twitter at Kennan Institute, or write on our Facebook page. Um, the Ukrainian constitution refers to Ukraine as a unitary state, uh, but also there have been various attempts to introduce local self-government and decentralize. So to what extent, after 30 years, is Ukraine still considered a unitary state? And to what extent does that interfere uh, with its overall democratic um, consolidation? Yeah. Uh, I, I can try to answer this question, uh, if you don't mind, because, uh, because only today uh, we were presented as a members of parliament with a new plan of decentralization and changes to our constitution. Uh, legally speaking, uh, Ukraine uh, has not been a classic unitary state. I would I uh, would call it a half unitary state because Crimea, autonomous republic of Crimea, had a special status in Ukraine. Uh, Ukraine is a very diverse country. If you look at it, uh, you can see that uh, there are peoples uh, of different nationalities, uh, different religions. Uh, different political views living in the same country. And we still have to learn how to live in one state. And this is a, a challenge sort of for us. Uh, I believe that what really unites us, it's like United States. Um, uh, Americans say that we belong to different uh, cultures, different uh, ethnicities, different races, but what really unites us, our constitution. And I also believe in this statement because we need to have our constitution, our constitutional rights, and not to try to impose on each other uh, any kind of ideology. Uh, the way out is in the process of decentralization, which is taking place uh, right now in Ukraine. It is important to give more power, more money to the lowest level, to people themselves, and let them decide for themselves how they, uh, to develop uh, self-governance uh, and to develop uh, a democratic mentality in them, which would be conducive to this uh, effective self-governance. So uh, I, I don't believe in federalization of Ukraine. Uh, I think it would be wrong way and uh, Russia could use it. Uh, but I believe in true decentralization uh, using, for example, experience of Poland 
or France or uh, other um, uh, Western democracies. Anyone else have an opinion about um, the unitary state and the prospects for decentralization in Ukraine? Uh, yeah, well, um, I again wanted to make a couple of connections here. Um, uh, the first one is exactly in line with what Alexander has just um, mentioned about self-governance, um, because that is if 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 uh, a more um, efforts at uh, boosting the participatory democracy and the kind of uh, cross-sectoral partnerships, uh, um, if more of these efforts are actually folded into the decentralization reform, I think that that uh, really could produce a kind of a win-win situation when you um, uh, you change the, admin the administrative structures by uh, decentralizing, but you also um, really uh, give a boost to uh, to how local politics is done and, and, and again, the local civil society and but also, for example, uh, small and medium enterprises, uh, you know, that uh, you find ways of, of sort of boosting their cooperation with other, with the public sector and so on and so forth. And this is, of course, we know from literature, this is really uh, uh, done much better on, on the city level, on the local level. So this, uh, this whole effort that is going on in Ukraine and it's, um, and it's massive and it's kind of been slow and it has its successes and its failures of, of decentralizing, um, it really is. Uh, uh, it it really can uh, bring this uh, this added value of uh, of sort of uh, boosting the bottom up democracy, if we wish, or a kind of more participatory element of it. Uh, but it also has uh, the uh, international element, especially again uh, looking uh, at uh, the kind of uh, inter international cooperation on the European level, because mm. European Union has been working for a few years now. On it uh, on transnational cooperation, the city to city cooperation, and things like that. And there's uh, um, there are all kinds of cooperation schemes within the European Union, but also with associated states. And Ukraine, of course, could benefit enormously from from those. And then again, this is something that uh, that could help uh, uh, boost cooperation uh, in in what might seem as a sort of a, a you know a technical and low politics area, but actually might yield much greater results in terms of prosperity and, and civic education um, and the quality of democracy on the ground uh, in a state like Ukraine. Isha, do you have any? Uh... Yes, I would like just to intervene here with uh, one assumption that uh, today, we, you, today Ukraine has reformed local communities. So there's amalgamated communities with, which do boost local politics, local democracy, budget hearings. I know it from my own parents who live in a small village in one of such communities. And there's also a new, uh, new structure of rayons, which is a painful issue. They were created in a probably fast way and were not necessarily communicated well to the citizens. Now that out of, let's say 20, Rayons, there are five or six per oblast. And then it means that many administrative, uh, administrative services are less accessible if uh, someone wants to get them directly. But then there was a smart move on, on the part of central government by providing many services online. Not everyone, especially in villages, can do this. It's, but still, there, there's a, a, an interplay and a, another process of finding some balance between uh, rural populations and these new rayons. And we are still in the, uh, we, in Ukraine, we still use the Soviet oblasts. And, and this is something uh, that really remains the legacy, formative, formative legacy of Soviet period. Uh, I could remind you that there was even a period when our, uh, internet domains always had a little addition of the oblast. So unlike in any other country, it was not only .ua, but it was like ZP from my Zaporizhia or uh, LV in Lviv. It took some time for us to drop it. But this kind of um, controversies and contradictions, they are still in there. And Ukraine needs to move ahead in order to create more balanced and smart and reasonable, rationally structured, as Alexander said, uh, structure of governance at all levels. 
subsidiarity, uh, keeping subsidiarity principle in mind. Thank you, Misha. We've had several questions about uh, oligarchs uh, in Ukraine. Uh, Daniel uh, Spitkovsky asked about the impact of oligarchs in the construction business, but I don't know if anyone's a construction expert here. So uh, if we could talk more generally about the impact of oligarchs on uh, Ukraine's democratic development and this new anti-oligarch law that has just been uh, passed. Yeah, I can try to, to respond to this question as a representative of, of our parliament and as a person who voted in favor of this anti-oligarchic, so to speak, anti-oligarchic uh, legislation, anti-oligarchic law. As for construction and influence of oligarchs, uh, it, it is a really painful problem for Ukraine and for Kiev. It's enough to take a look at the architecture and to see how it was distorted, disfigured by, uh, uh, by building, uh, buildings which just don't correspond to uh, traditional old architecture of Kyiv, which just spoiled the face of Kyiv. And it's a great pity. To me, it's a sign of corruption. And uh, we have to deal with this issue. And now it's a problem of the authorities of Kyiv, Klitschko, for example. He is, he is responsible for, for the order in this respect as regards Kyiv. As for anti-oligarchic law, we should keep in mind that uh, it's uh, extraordinary law, uh, law because situation with the oligarchic uh, system in Ukraine is serious. Uh, the thing is that uh, there are basically uh, several models uh, dealing with oligarchs. The first model, which was used by Putin, by Russia, uh, at certain, uh, he started in charge, in command of the country, and he managed to uh, sort of to uh, 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 subordinate them to his own needs. He's, uh, he stood uh, above the oligarchs and now he's in control. He decides who will be oligarch and for how long. In Ukraine, situation uh, was different till now. Uh, it was a situation where uh, oligarchs played uh, very serious, uh, they had a tremendous influence upon uh, upon politics and uh, upon mass media. Oligarchs had their own and still have their own TV channels which brainwash people. And it, it's a serious problem. Uh, President Zelensky has started uh, his campaign against oligarchs and his attempts to dismantle the oligarchic system in Ukraine by uh, 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 not only him, but the Council of uh, National Security uh, by uh, uh, imposing sanctions and practically banning uh, oligarchic uh, pro-Russian channels, which uh, was a soft type Russian propaganda. Uh, uh, now we want to uh, create a, a country in which there will be rich people, but there will be no oligarchs. By oligarchs, we mean not only rich people, we mean uh, those people who have influence upon politics, who buy politicians in the parliament, who uh, steal from the budget, who brainwash uh, people with their propaganda, and it's a serious problem. We have to change the country to make it more democratic and to uh, uh, free from oligarchic influence. And this is the essence of this uh, law, anti-oligarchic law, which is a framework legislation, because uh, it will be also, uh, mm, there will be additions to this uh, law. Thank you. If I may, Will, um, on Focus Ukraine, several months ago, I published a skeptical analysis of this law. I recognize that it's a brave act to fight with the oligarchs, but it kind of misses the aim. Uh, however, in recent weeks, there was a, a plan and information that uh, the, the, the ruling party is preparing the plan, so-called 20 steps to fight oligarchy which was prepared by the Ministry of Justice. And there I see much smarter moves. And it means that it's not one law uh, policy. It, it fall, it's a longer term policy. And institutions like anti-monopoly committee, for example, it will, uh, is planned to be reformed. And if this will be done, 
then uh, Ukrainian government will be able to fight not only oligarchs, but oligarchy as a principle, as a principle where the informal private groups use public budget, public institutions for their personal benefit. This could be, this system could be destroyed by several uh, systemic actions. And it looks like in this plan that there are several very smart and very rational steps. And again, uh, in recent seven years, there was a, a new anti-corruption institution system created with the uh, uh, anti-corruption bureau, with special anti-corruption prosecutor, with uh, high uh, anti-corruption uh, court. So basically there's an infrastructure that can be used, but so far it didn't make a strong anti-oligarchic uh, impact. So in a way, if the 20 steps are gonna be implemented, th this plan, then uh, we may see Ukraine quite a different country. Thank, thank you, Misha. So we only have about, uh... Uh, 15 minutes to go, and several questions are still arriving. Um, I want to follow up on the last question, though, um, and I'll have Alexander uh, focus uh, focus on this question. Uh, obviously, there all have been a lot of institutions that have been created to deal with corruption, uh, but the legal system on the whole has not really been able to deal with these elements of corruption. Uh, whether in the procuracy, in the constitutional court, and so forth. So why has it been so difficult to introduce fundamental legal reform in Ukraine? Uh, in terms of fighting corruption, you mean? Fighting corruption or even creating new institutions as well. And, and unfortunately, uh, we have yes. to... Uh, a brief answer and, and everyone... Uh, yes, a, a brief answer to a large question. Uh, yes, it's it's hard to give a, a brief uh, answer because it's really a, a really difficult one of the key problems, contemporary problems for Ukraine, and it's a huge challenge. Uh, we uh, have created the system, anti-corruption system, triad sort of, uh, including uh, NABU, uh, National Bureau, anti-corruption bureau, uh, uh, Office of Prosecutor, anti-corruption prosecutor, and. Uh, some other uh, new organs. They're independent, which is important. They're new, and we uh, have big hopes that uh, these organs will be effective. And they have already proved being effective in fighting corruption, even at the top level in Ukraine. So I think they will continue this. And uh, I believe also that one of the best ways to fight corruption is a personal example, a personal example in terms of uh, top politicians. Uh, so it, it's also um, it's also a way to to fight corruption. So uh, it, we understand that it will take some time to win a victory over corruption, and it's not a matter of one day. Uh, but we continue along this path, and uh, I think that the situation is uh, getting better. Okay. The the next question comes from Pat Patricia Jean. Uh, what is the role of youth, women, minorities, religious groups, or other demographics in Ukrainian independence? Katerina, I think we'll have you lead off on that one. Uh, in Ukraine's independence. Uh, yes. Well, I, I think I've already mentioned a few elements and, and exactly. they all come, come together, right? I mean, there was a an important women's movement uh, in uh, in the late 80s, important environmental movement. Um, so there were uh, um, uh, there were some elements of that nascent civil society that then sort of provided the backbone for for a subsequent um, civic uh, awakening, so to say. Um, it's interesting, for example, also with uh, since the um, annexation of Crimea. Um, the uh, the importance of the the mobilization of the uh, of the uh, Crimean Tatar minority, of course, um, that was effectively squeezed out of Crimea. At least the, the leadership they had their own uh, when they returned to Crimea in in the early nineties uh, after having been deported by Stalin. Uh, 
um, uh, they were allowed to form uh, their own uh, self-governance uh, 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 bodies uh, in Crimea. Um, uh, and so uh, that, of course, had to, had to relocate uh, uh, to Ukraine proper after Crimea was annexed. And uh, um, it was, I, I always thought there was a, quite a, um, an unexpected twist of uh, historical twist that uh, uh, Crimean Tatars since 20, 2014 became kind of this uh, a very mobilized and very active group that was uh, pro-Ukrainian statehood and, and that was trying to strike alliances, pushing, for example, Turkey to, uh, to express its support for Ukrainian uh, sovereignty because, uh, of course, of, of the common ethnic uh, background, right? So it didn't quite work that, uh, uh, to the extent that uh, they were hoping, but still this, these unexpected alliances I thought were quite, um, I thought were quite striking. And, and it was also very important symbolically because it underlined the fact, uh, uh, you know, there were several competing narratives around the crisis in Ukraine in 2014, and 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 the, the kind of activism of of the Crimean Tatar minority, for example, really underlined the uh, the the point and kind of uh, uh, became the evidence for the narrative that was talking about Ukrainian statehood as a sort of a civic nation, that inclusive civic nation, as opposed to kind of a a nation that is uh, um, uh, captured by one uh, uh, radical nationalist uh, group, right? So uh, I think that was for an, an, an unexpected and interesting alliance that again shows us that the, the, the Ukrainian national uh, uh, civic nationhood uh, has uh, kind of prevailed in a way. So, um, uh, so there, I think there are lots of very exciting. I mean, we don't have time to go into detail, but I, I think there are lots of exciting examples and and. Uh, these kinds of things really flourish when you have uh, the kind of societal uh, uh, opportunities, the kind of the civic space that is open enough and diverse enough to 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 include these things and and to create to give space um, uh, for these things to flourish. And then that's that shouldn't be uh, absolutely taken for granted. So Mihail mentioned the securitization of of public discourse in Ukraine because of the war. I think that's uh, that's very worrying, and we should be very vigilant that. Um, that the civic space in Ukraine remains open and diverse and and uh, uh, and really uh, uh, functions the way I have just tried to briefly describe. Thank you. Um, our next question comes from Yuzos Kaslas, and he asks, to what extent is there personal communication between ordinary people in Ukraine and Russia is such personal communication greater or less, less from different parts of Ukraine? How does it affect opinion in Russia? And I think that kind of ties into obviously more current developments, um, but to what extent are kind of old ties still forged? Uh, and to what extent does the rhetoric from Russia overwhelm that? Uh, I can try to answer. This, of course, the war which we have with Russia uh, had a huge role uh, on the attitude of Ukrainians to uh, the state which is aggressor. And Russia occupies uh, part of our territory. It occupies Crimea. It occupies part of uh, the eastern part of Ukraine, Don part of Donbass, and it couldn't uh, have positive effect, of course. And it had brought a severance of many personal contacts between Russians and Ukrainians. At the same time, uh, taking into consideration uh, contemporary um, use of communications like internet, no one, no one can prevent uh, Russian-Ukrainian citizens uh, communicating with each other. Uh, there are also uh, Ukrainian citizens of Ukraine who go, uh, who work in Russia. This is also reality. Uh, and uh, uh, at the same time, uh, for instance, Russian propaganda plays uh, a huge destructive role, especially in the occupied territory. And Ukraine is trying to create uh, alternative to this Russian propaganda. For instance, we have a TV channel called House Dom. And the goal of this uh, TV channel is to tell the truth to uh, uh, our people, our citizens living in the occupied territories and uh, uh, to, to Russians also. 
because uh, we um, need to uh, explain to them the truth and maybe it will have influence upon Russian society and it will make changes in its state and uh, which will help to stop Russian aggression against Ukraine. Um, Mikhail, Mikhail or uh, Katerina, do you want to at least talk a little bit about uh, current U.S. Uh, Ukrainian Russian relations and now I just want to in contact? I just wanted to add uh, uh, another sad piece of evidence. I think that the recent uh, uh, opinion polls in Russia, released by Levada uh, Center, um, uh, show a, a huge percentage of Russians who have a negative at, uh, image of, of Ukraine and Ukrainians. So uh, this thing works uh, both ways in the sense that Russia, Ukrainians, of course, feel themselves um, you know, uh, um, don't feel themselves, they are at, at, at war with, with Russia and so uh, I do not really have a very positive view of, uh, of Russia, but that works the other way around as well. And, and, um, and these are the ties that are, uh, you know, uh, easy to break, hard to repair. So that, that's, that's another damage, let's say, uh, that's maybe often overlooked, uh, brought, uh, brought about by, by the war, the kind of societal attitudes and and, and the linkage is that people are not even trying to keep anymore because of this um, hostile attitudes. I would also like to add that these horizontal lines between Ukraine and Russian populations are getting harder and harder. When the war started, the, the families that were separated by the borders were also separated by different opinions. And uh, that brought a lot of tragic uh, situations into Ukrainian life in 2014 or 15. And since 2015, there's a constant uh, balance of distrust and disrespect by Russians and Ukrainians, uh, which shows on these studies by Levada Center and the Kyiv uh, International Institute of, of Sociology. This, to, th th this is an, an issue if, in order to restart the peace process in the future, it's going to be an issue because uh, two societies have forgotten how to how to communicate, and this dialogue is uh, very difficult. Still, there's a possibility for travel between Ukraine and Russia. It's much less so, but still exists. And in in Russia, there's the biggest uh, uh, com ethnic community. It's uh, Ukrainian community, about three million uh, migrants, Ukrainian citizens living more or less permanently on the Russian soil while in Europe, there's an estimation of two, two and a half million people. So basically there's this, still the, the presence of Ukraine on Russian soil is um, uh, quite big and maybe this community in the future will help to reestablish normal uh, relations when the time will come. Well, on that note, we're gonna to have to bring our conversation to a close, but I wanna thank all of our panelists and all of you who attended and asked questions, I apologize if we didn't get to all the questions, uh, but I, I wanna thank our speakers for just an excellent discussion on the 30th anniversary of independence and other current developments in Ukraine. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. It was a wonderful discussion. Thank you.